but we're glad you're here. This is going to be a fun event tonight. It is part of a whole series of worldwide alumni club events. There are 46 of these that are happening all over the world at approximately uh, the same time. Uh, since we're here in New York, we wanted to put together a team on a special topic for you, which we will, will do. But I wanted to first welcome you and just tell you just a couple of things that are, are happening in our world and then turn the program over to Bruce Usher. Once the panel has concluded, there'll be plenty of time for uh, drinks and food back where you were. So when we're done here, uh, your evening's not done, you're welcome to go back over there. I just welcome the most amazing young people on the planet to Columbia Business School, and I get to do it every year, multiple times a year. They're always amazing. And one of the interesting things is uh, why they come. So this afternoon, I went over to Rutgers to speak to AACSB, which is, uh, I guess, sort of a trade union of business schools. I'm not sure how you describe it. And I spoke to business school deans from all over the world. And they were asking me, so how, how do you get this amazing set of people? And I said, there are three things people come to us for. One is ideas. They hope and expect that the men and women in front of the room have some ideas that aren't just good for their discipline. They actually move the needle of business. The second is talent, which is just a code word for the students themselves, that they are going to learn a lot from each other. And the third is the network, which is a code word for you. Now, when they come to business school, I think the reason they pick us and the reason these guys are so good on campus is because they're looking for a real experience. A thousand years ago, when I went to school, training was pretty siloed by functional areas. Economics, my favorite subject, and I can tell by looking at you, your favorite subject. <laughs> Economics, finance, accounting, things like that. Now, of course, we're trying to get people to think like business people very early and make complex business decisions. So they come to us seeking three things. They want to learn to think like an entrepreneur. They want to be able to identify an opportunity and capture it. They want to connect the dots. They know that the world's complicated. There are lots of interesting patterns. They want to put them together. And you can't do that by just taking course after course in a narrow area. And they want to develop themselves as leaders. The new students who just came, the very first thing they did after general orientation hoopla is take the core course in leadership. It's a class called LEAD. And it's built on the social psychology work of my colleagues. So we've taken what we're doing in research, putting in practice with the students, and at the centerpiece of our core. So it's, uh, it's all good. There are lots of engagement opportunities and touch points for you. We would like to have as much of your time as possible. We want you on campus. I sell a 1,000 people a year. I want you to buy them. Uh, I want you to think about reunions. How many of you graduated in a year ending in a two or a seven? That means you are invited to your reunion in April, which is, in fact, April 21st through 23rd. Last year, we had about 2,500 of the school's closest friends. Expect a bigger crowd uh, this year. You'll have a wonderful time, not only with your own class, but getting to know again some faculty you may remember uh, and uh, catch up, uh, to catch up with the school. I mentioned that there are 46 activities like this around the world. There are more than 70 alumni clubs. And wherever you are in the world, we have something for you. So please, please, please stay connected. I wanted to also give you special thanks in terms of a giving update and the financial muscle of the school. Last year, you know, we started celebrating our centennial. This year is our 100th birthday of Columbia Business School. We've gone all over the world celebrating with alumni and business leaders. In our 100th year, we raised more than $100 million uh, for the school. Without one single large gift, it was just a very, very good year for Columbia. We have benefited a lot from a lot of people who have participated in annual giving for the school. I know that includes a lot of people in this room, and we thank you for it. You know, I sometimes remind students that about a third of our budget comes from something other than tuition. That's just a code word for annual giving and for endowment income. For those of you who just can't resist giving money to us a lot, we have a giving day. Uh, coming up in Columbia University on October 26th. Got some competitions, 
check your, check your website for that. The reason I mention those facts is that what resources do is help us for the future. And I know that if you listen to people in my profession in economics, they're telling you the future is not going to be as bright. I mean, the buzzword among economists is secular stagnation. I don't want you to believe that at all, and I'll tell you why. Every stop I've made for the school's centennial, I've said to people, I've had the privilege of having this job now for more than a decade. And I list for the youngest people in the room the storied businesses that they accept as the hallmarks of American enterprise that were only a glimmers, if that, the day I started my job. It will be true 10 years from now, just as it was 10 years ago. This school needs to be the place for the resources to capture that future. One area in which we're doing that is the area we're going to talk about tonight. Writ large, we have a very big emphasis in the school on social enterprise. We had many years ago, some of you may remember, a not-for-profit management program. That became much larger and much more involved in the school. Many of our students, even students who don't have a particular interest in the not-for-profit sector themselves, have a heavy interest in social enterprise, and we encourage that. Part of being a well-rounded business person is having that interest. Some people are interested in not-for-profit boards and in investing, which we're going to talk about tonight. The Tamer Center in the school is our focal point uh, for social enterprise, and I'm pleased to say that our moderator this evening is the faculty director for the Tamer Center, uh, Bruce Usher, who I think I know some of you, when I was talking with you at drinks, had the pleasure of having Bruce in class. Uh, he knows he is going to entertain tonight, too, and he stands ready to do that. Bruce has had a wonderful career in the private sector, in finance, in social enterprise. He is here, I'm pleased to say, in the school with us full time, uh, doing this as well, uh, and as I say, is in our Tamer Center. I'm going to let him introduce the wonderful panel we have tonight and lead the discussion. So I'll get out of the way and go to the back. Bruce, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. So welcome. Welcome to the intersection of philanthropy and impact investing. As Dean Hubbard mentioned, uh, I'm faculty director of the Tamer Center. And within the center, we're responsible for anything where the intersection of business and society uh, are, exists. And impact investing is a fairly new area for the center, a fairly new sector altogether. Uh, it's a course that I now teach in the business school. And I'm really pleased that we have a panel tonight that are some of the most experienced people in the sector. I'm going to take two minutes just to get us all on the same page, because this is a new sector. Um, and start off by really describing what, what is impact investing? What are we talking about here? Uh, there are a lot of definitions and ideas around it, but I go back to the, uh, the definition the Rockefeller Foundation originally described about a half dozen years ago. And their definition of impact investing are investments intended to create social impact in addition to financial return or beyond financial return. The key word there is intended. There's an intention to create some social impact as well as uh, financial return. Simple enough and popular enough. Today, every major investment bank has a group focused on this. Morgan Stanley has a sustainable finance group that several of our uh, students intern every year. Goldman Sachs recently acquired one of the leading impact investment firms and has focused on it. JP Morgan's been doing this for a number of years, and I can go on. It's not just in the U.S., it's also global. Uh, the uh, Financial Times ran a survey recently of family offices and high net worth uh, individuals and foundations and found that 53% reported activity in impact investing. So the question is why? Why are we seeing all this growth? And the simple answer is that impact investing has the potential to scale that philanthropy has always been challenged by because there is far more private capital out there than philanthropic capital. There always has been and there always will be. So the potential to bring private capital into addressing our social challenges provides the opportunity to scale. And that makes it inherently attractive. 
But as anyone who has tried it knows that impact investing has challenges. How do you measure impact? How do you even define impact? How do you decide what to focus on? We have a lot of social and environmental challenges ahead of us. How do you find the balance between philanthropy and impact investing? So the good news is we have a panel to address all of those questions for you. Um, and the format this evening, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction here. We have Preeti Bhattacharjee from Heron Foundations, one of the original foundations uh, focused on the space, Julius Mockrauer from Serious Change, Kurt LaBelle from the Global Health Investment Fund, and Bonnie Mullenbrook from Investor Circle. I've asked each of them to take five minutes to tell you what they're doing in this space, a couple, couple things they're seeing out there, no more than five minutes, so that we have a good 20 or 30 minutes together for Q&A. Because my experience with these, with these alumni events is that you have a lot of good questions and you're not inhibited to tell us what they are. Um, so I want to make sure we have plenty of time for that. So uh, we're going to go in order. And Preeti, I'm going to hand it right over to you. All right. Do I need to do something with this? Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm Preeti. I'm here from the Heron Foundation. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the room. I'm actually going to give you just a very quick and dirty about the foundation, and I'll flag some places we can go deeper, but I want to go where it's useful to, for you guys to go, so, um, so we'll rely on Q&A to take us there. Uh, before I get started, just a quick straw poll of the room. How many people here have experience doing some kind of impact investing? All right. And how many people here have some experience working with some kind of private foundation? Either on the board? Okay, great. Um, that helps with some level setting. So you guys actually might know plenty about the Heron Foundation already, but uh, in a nutshell, we're a private foundation. We've been around since 1992, and our mission since then hasn't changed. It's been to help people help themselves out of poverty with an implicit focus on the United States. It's domestically focused. Um, the way in which we've done that since 92 has changed dramatically. And so to explain the way in which it's changed, I'm going to give you some quick foundation one-on-one. -on -one. It'll be a repeat for a bunch of people in the room. Um, but private foundation 101. Typically, a foundation is created when you end up with an endowment, so you end up with a gift of some kind. Um, that's the corpus. That corpus is invested in the market, yields 7 8% if you're lucky. Um, you scrape off the top of that, and you give that yield away in the form of grants. Classic. It's a horrible oversimplification, but that's kind of Foundations 101. Um, and so a few years ago, we went through some leadership change at the Heron Foundation, and the new leadership came in and saw that that's the way we had been operating for, for a number of years and said, wait a second. Our mission is to help people help themselves out of poverty. The way in which we do that is typically through job creation. We try and help support uh, job creation for low-income people in America. And the grants that we're giving away are absolutely doing that. They're absolutely supporting that mission. But what about the corpus? What about the 95% of the assets? Um, and like any good business person, she said, wait, our, our assets are under-leveraged. They're underutilized. 95% of our assets aren't actually doing the thing that we're designed to do. Um, can we do better? What does that mean? What does that look like? And so we launched at that point on a, on a learning journey. And the very first step of that journey was to ask, what's in that 95%? What are we invested in? Uh, we call that the Portfolio Examination Project. And that was actually a surprisingly difficult uh, set of questions to answer. What at the enterprise level are we invested in? Not at the vehicle level, not at the manager level, not at the intermediary level. What's the list of companies we're invested in? Uh, most foundations can't actually answer that, um, or they can't answer it immediately or easily. Um, but we started to answer it, and then it started to raise other, uglier questions. Like, we were invested in private prison companies. And we said, is that, are we comfortable with that? Is that contrary to our mission? Uh, we were invested in Walmart. That was a complicated one. Um, we were invested in, we can run through the list of, of things that bubbled up, but things started to bubble up, and then we started to say, wait a second. Are our investments actually feeding the very problems our grants are trying to solve? And if so, are 95% of our assets doing the thing we don't want to do? Um, and so that launched us into impact investing. And we had a dramatic strategic review and said, uh, we need to bring these assets in alignment with our mission. And so we committed for, to be 100% in alignment with our mission uh, by 2017. And that's when I actually joined the foundation. We went through that rollover process over the last roughly four years. It's, we've had very aggressive redeployment. Uh, and we're on track. We're at about 75% mission alignment at the moment. Um, happy to chat about that journey with the group. Uh, it's been long and complicated, and we've made plenty of mistakes. And hopefully I can tell you about them, and you won't make them yourselves if you go on this journey. Um, 
but that's where we are. We're still very diversely invested, public and private, debt equity, directly and indirectly. Um, happy to speak to some of the things in the portfolio if useful. Happy to talk about that journey. Happy to flag the advisors we've used. But that's us in a nutshell. And the last thing I'll flag before we move on is um, part of the reason we did this was in part because of our own discomfort when we saw it was in the portfolio. And in part because we realized we're, we're a philanthropic institution. We're tax exempt based on the presumption that we're doing good things with this money. So this to us wasn't an option. It was a fiduciary obligation. If we, in fact, are a philanthropic institution, that presumably means all of our assets should be doing good things. Um, and it's a wildly imperfect system. I'm not going to pretend it's easy or clean or measuring impact is a, uh, is a walk in the park. But that to us is our North Star. We, are, we get up every day and we presume every asset that we invest in should be for mission. Uh, and that's what we do. Hello, is this working? Hey. Well, I'm Julie Smokrauer from Serious Change. We focus on early stage investments that drive social change, and we're targeting market rate returns. We've been doing it since about 2007. We're on fund two. We invest through the life cycle of the companies. We'll start as small as two, 300,000 in seed and invest through Series A and Series B. To date, I think we've made about 70 investments, and we're still actively sourcing investments in education, energy, let's see if I can get all these, uh, health and wellness, transformative finance, base of the pyramid, sustainable products, and mission-driven uh, technologies. Um, myself, I've been in the space about seven, eight years. Um, I'll give you a little context about myself because I assume some of you are thinking about it and many of you are in the for-profit sector. So I, I'm a creature of the for-profit sector. Uh, for the decades before, uh, I started and grew some companies here and in Latin America. I was in pharmaceutical R&D at Merck and I managed a multi-asset class uh, proprietary trading portfolio on Wall Street. And then I hopped into this. And the reason I hopped into this is because I was looking for more meaning in my work. And my heart was fully in it. But I tell you, that Spock part of my brain was going, I'm not sure this can work. How could I get market rate returns and create impact? It just seemed like too high of a bar. Over, over the years, that's changed a bit. Because I've, I've seen 70 companies and their returns. I've seen the portfolio. Um, and we're not quite there yet, but it's trending well. The, the quality of deals, the quality of entrepreneurs, the, and the entire ecosystem is really uh, coming together. So I can't really share the performance of our portfolio. Preeti can. We talked about that before. But what I can share with you, and I thought I'd just take a couple minutes. What button do I hit? Um, is some of the factors that make... Uh, the risk reward of impact investments different than traditional investments. And I'm going to stand up because my back is bothering me. Um, the first is access to seed capital. Uh, and this is sort of a negative. We don't have enough seed investors. So hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Any of you in the audience who might want to do it, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, and there's a lot of great companies out there, and they need help getting from seed to series A. So that's one of the negatives. One of the positives on the financing front is there are organizations like Heron and many others, who, uh, especially the ones that are concessionary in nature, which provide a lower cost of capital for these companies. They're attracted to impact companies. And it makes a big difference. A lot of times I see in some of my companies that they're funding longer term projects that are never funded in my, for my traditional venture investments. They're just not done. Another thing are the, the teams. You get a different class of entrepreneurs. You get a class of entrepreneurs in these impact investments who believe deeply in the impact. And what does that mean? They're willing to do it for less money. The dollars go farther. But most importantly, when you hit bumps in the road and all of these companies do it, they don't just close up shop. They stick with it. Because it, it's, it's more than the money, it's more than everything for them. And I think that's pretty powerful. The last point is really about, for a high net worth individual, I think that the write-offs, if you think about the failures in your space, 
uh, for impact investing is actually lower there than in traditional investing. And here is the reason why. Bear with me for a second. In these impact companies, impact tends to start on day one. Okay? It happens well, typically it happens well before profitability, and it can happen before you even have a dollar of revenue. So what happens while they're trying to start up these companies for three, four years, even if they fail, is they've accumulated a bunch of impact. And when I look at it in my own portfolio, I start to say, well, wait a minute. Let me compare that to that donation I made. And I go, wow, it looks better. And I write it off anyway, so I get the tax deduction. <laughs> and so in that way, I don't consider those failures. I move them from one part of the portfolio to another. They become a donation. So and the, speaking of sort of the impact, I've got an example here. I like to look at impact return on analysis, and I'll be quick, um, which is basically what's the bang for my buck? I give a dollar. What am I going to get out of it? And so I have a, two quick examples up here, which is two companies that both need a million dollars and it's going to get them to 10 million in sales. One is a call center company that hires a workforce of homebound diabetics uh, to deliver their service. Another one is a clinic in the developing world for the poor for diabetics. At 10 million in sales, one impacts the lives of 120 diabetics annually. The other one impacts 80,000. Now, to the point I was making earlier, they slug it out for three years, and I know the bottom company pretty well. They slug it out for three years, they've already impacted the lives of 30,000 people. So at 100 bucks a pop, if I look at all the capital they've raised, They've transformed people's lives. That looks like a pretty good donation to me. Now, as it turns out, I think they'll do well. I use this to actually look between my own personal asset classes. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kurt. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. I'll stand also so that I can see everybody. And uh, also have a few slides that I can walk through. Um, I did a, a joint degree at, at Columbia, and uh, I'm very grateful for everything that I, I learned there and really appreciate uh, a lot of what uh, the dean referenced in terms of the, the network uh, and the skills and, and being able to meet a lot of people like you. Uh, so I really appreciate that, and it, it's uh, an honor to be here today. Um, I manage the Global Health Investment Fund, and if we can go to those slides... Uh, I can walk you through a little bit about the fund. So the Global Health Investment Fund was actually structured by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, it received investments from a number of blue chip investors such as Pfizer, Merck, GSK, AXA, Grand Challenges Canada, and a number of others. And the goals of the Global Health Investment Fund are pretty simple, uh, but it is uh, somewhat difficult to execute. Uh, but the goals are, are twofold, and they're equally important. One is to generate positive financial returns for the investors, uh, much like a traditional fund although uh, our, our goals are a little less lofty. We are trying to match approximately market returns, um, although we, we hope to exceed that. Uh, and then the other equally important goal for us is to achieve impact. And we support only products that can have a meaningful effect in the developing world and be delivered to the developing world at an affordable price. And those, that, that requirement in and of itself means that most of the medical companies that a traditional venture capital fund would look at uh, just don't qualify for our investment criteria uh, because we will not back uh, an interventional cardiology device that uh, would cost $10,000 and would require a highly trained interventional cardiologist to place it. So that, that just wouldn't work uh, because, one, the price, and two, it just wouldn't be practical to deliver in most of these uh, limited resource settings. Uh, but that said, there are many, many opportunities uh, out there that do qualify on both of those fronts. And that's what has been exciting to us um, in the early days of the fund is to see the great deal flow and to echo what Julia said, the passion that a lot of the entrepreneurs in this space really have. They're, they're committed. Um, and also, just as a side note, the diligence is a lot more fun in this space. Um, as background, I was doing traditional venture and growth capital investing uh, before coming over and, and managing this fund. 
And what I noticed doing the traditional diligence is when you would speak with an orthopedic surgeon or a, uh, a neurosurgeon, uh, inevitably at the end of the call, uh, they would say, and I'll send you my bill uh, immediately. In, in this space, we will speak with world leaders, thought leaders on, you know, in tuberculosis and HIV, other infectious diseases, maternal and child care, and they want to help. And it's been so refreshing to me to see that, and it's, it's really rewarding and helpful. Um, if we can go to uh, the other slides here, uh, just some examples of the types of investments that we've made uh, going through the portfolio, some point-of-care diagnostics uh, to diagnose preeclampsia in women in the first trimester uh, would be one. We have an oral cholera vaccine, uh, which, uh, oddly enough, there was only one supplier in the world in, in massive shortages, and we've been funding a second supplier to get out there, and we've been pleasantly surprised uh, to see that the demand is actually exceeding what, what we can produce. Um, we funded a, a drug for the development of, uh, or for, we funded the development of a drug uh, that targets uh, river blindness or onchocerciasis. And we have a handheld uh, laboratory in a box uh, that can enable point of care diagnosis uh, in rural settings. And, and many of these also will have applications in the developed world. Uh, the handheld lab, we think, is going to be something that can be used for at-home testing. So we really like those opportunities where there is a dual market opportunity where it, it can help in the developing world and then it can uh, also be uh, profitable in the, in the developed world. If you go to the next one uh, here, we, we actually we think some of the things that differentiate the fund are that we actually require commitments from these companies. So when we invest, part of the, uh, the commitment from the company is that they will make the products available in the developing world to specific countries that we outlined, their low and low middle income countries, um, at prices that are affordable there. And that can be, you know, that depends on the company. Uh, a lot of work goes into uh, actually deciding what those prices are, uh, but they have those commitments. Um, also, in some cases, we have commitments from them to use proceeds from sales to uh, purchase and deliver the products. So these are, are real uh, legal commitments that we get from the companies. And then we have an actual committee called the Charitab Charitability Oversight Committee. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but their sole duty is to make sure that when we make an investment, we have these legal commitments uh, to make these products available uh, to the people who need them uh, the most. And I think we can go to the last one here. Um, the ways that we measure success, there's the, the financial success. Uh, I mentioned before we're trying to, to match the, uh, the public markets, essentially. And then the impact success. So we are looking at, in our case, since we're in the healthcare space, we're looking at lives saved and lives improved. And we can, you know, it's not an exact science, uh, but we have spent a lot of time with each company defining what those metrics are and how to decide if you deliver 100,000 uh, cholera vaccines, approximately how many lives you're, you're saving and how many lives you're improving based on what the prevalence or incidence of that disease would have been without the vaccine and what you're seeing it to be uh, with the vaccine. And then, of course, uh, uh, raising future funds is also another indicator of success uh, that, uh, that we're doing our jobs well and uh, bringing more people into, uh, into the impact investment space. So thank you. All right, and I guess I'll be standing, too. I like to see everybody as well. Um, I'm Bonnie Mullenbrock, again, from Investor Circle. And... Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've known Bruce working in the space for a long time, even before Columbia. So it's, it's a pleasure to be back always in New York. And I was greeted by President Obama. I came out of the subway at 53rd and Lex at 2 o'clock today, and the motorcade went by. So <laughs> I was like, wow, that was quite a welcome. Um, Investor Circle, Angel Network for Impact Investing. Quick way to think about it. We are the largest and most active early stage impact investing network. We've driven $200 million into over 330 35 companies now, um, all dedicated to educational improvement or health, environment or community, economic development, etc. And we do this by cultivating a network of individuals, foundations, family offices, uh, and funds, all of whom are interested in having their investments generate 
benefits as well as return. And so it's important to cultivate that group. There's beginner investors as well as people who've been at this a while. Um, and we provide a community to do this with, which is you benefit from like any angel group from other people's experiences as well as um, it's just a lot more fun that way I would say and we also provide quality deal flow so at the same time we're also attracting entrepreneurs who can apply online and vetting those companies and then we bring them together with our investors at local meetings and national events when IC was founded nearly 25 years ago there weren't a lot of people thinking this way so as a national organization and maybe some of you do angel investing know that, that tends to be a localized activity um, and we are now getting to a point where there's critical mass. We have six markets, including New York, where we have local meetings monthly or quarterly, looking at local deals, and we also share those across our network. So we had a national event last week in San Francisco where we brought the best and brightest of uh, the companies we'd seen over the past quarter to our members at that event. And I think it's worthy of noting that um, about half of our members are individuals, about 30% are funds, and what used to be the other category, foundations and family offices, that is starting to grow, actually. And we're going to have to start splitting that out. Um, I think it's very interesting, given this was the intersection of impact investing and philanthropy, we're seeing a lot more philanthropists coming into this space, which I think is exciting, and I have some thoughts on that. Um, I also want to point out that 40% of our members are women, which is quite high for venture capital and angel investing. And also quite high is the fact that over the past five years, 40% of the companies funded have been women-led companies. And I think there's a direct correlation there about who's in the room. And I think not because we've necessarily tried to bring women in, but we have a connection, I think, um, in terms of connecting with things some women care about, um, they can connect to and get involved. So that's something that we're excited about, looking to getting it to 50%. Uh, so some thoughts I've had. Uh, I was asked, say, well, what have you learned? And I think it's really important to know that relationships matter. I think anybody who does early stage investing would agree. This is... Um, Risky stuff, and a lot of it comes down to the entrepreneur and developing a relationship and, and that being a trusted one in terms of their ability to, what we like to, how we like to say, pivot when things don't go as planned because nothing ever goes as planned. I don't know if any of you, has any of you has ever seen it go as the business plan said? No. So that's important. And that's why our network is really important because we need good relationships among investors and entrepreneurs as well as among the investors. There's great value we're bringing with the local networks, um, connecting with entrepreneurs on the ground. But someone in Denver could, could know all about batteries uh, and the company that pitched the other day here, just yesterday in New York. Our members can benefit from that expertise and that relationship. So that's something to keep in mind because there's a lot of talk about platforms and such, which I think are wonderful tools. Um, but relationships are important here. Thinking about philanthropy, like I mentioned, we see a lot more philanthropists coming into this space. We used to probably like the typical investor circle member would have been like Julius, mid-career business um, career or finance, saying, gee, I want more meaning or I want to bring my heart into the room as well as my head. Um, we still have a lot of those folks, but now we're seeing a lot more philanthropists coming in too saying we need to be more innovative about how we get our impact done and I think this is really exciting and I'm excited about what they bring and a lot of people are like well geez do I can I learn how to do this um, maybe I, sh I shouldn't say things like this at the business school but I don't think it's rocket science I think anybody can learn this and so I, I like bring, bringing people in and saying, yep, yeah, you, can, you can get these skills. And what you have learned through your philanthropic work and the issues you care about matter when we're looking at these business models. We need to understand where the real impact is and what the real problems are and know, it does, does the business model really address it? So I'm excited about uh, philanthropy getting more and more engaged here. And just some things that we're thinking about as IC is about to enter its next 25 years. Um, and, you know, and Julia has touched on some of these really well. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all model. It's not like Silicon Valley and you do the, the, you look at a deal all the same way with that same term sheet. We need to be thinking about lots of different types of structuring of deals to make sure it's the appropriate capital at the right time for the company. There's grants, again, phil phil coordinating with philanthropists around their granting, uh, what we also like to call non-dilutive capital, um, it is an important thing. And even, phil even grants can be harmful to companies if they're not... Uh, supporting the right activities to help keep them moving along on developing their business model. So that's something we're thinking a lot about and doing work around our network to help philanthropists and investors coordinate better around their capital provision. Um, human capital from the start, we also think it's important to stress this, the team. Um, and it's not just about the founding social entrepreneur, the big hero. Um, 
there's some there's an interesting article I recommend recommend everybody check out called Heropreneurship that stresses maybe we were a little bit uh, too um, hero worshiping in that regard, and we need to think about teams. I think that's a very important thing. So it's something we'll be providing more um, support around those strategies with our network and entrepreneurs that come through, and then social capital, the connection to not just the money but the other networks and customers and strategic partners and all that the relationships uh, with other entrepreneurs and our investors can bring are really important in doing that in a very deliberate way um, as we think about this kind of early stage investing. So that's some things on my mind and we look forward to taking questions, I believe. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's terrific. That's terrific. Um, so here's the plan. We have a little bit of time to get some questions from all of you. Um, the ground rules are uh, please use the mic, which here, just put up your hand and we'll get you a mic. Um, please questions only, not comments. Uh, we have more networking afterwards, more drinks, so a lot of time for comments uh, after that. Um, and who's got questions for the panelists? Please. Uh, I've never seen an alumni group that did not have questions. This, this is uh, unheard of. Questions all the way in the back. We'll start there. Okay, I'll stand too. Uh, so I think it's pretty certain right now that impact investing is a rapidly growing field, but it's still a field at its infancy. How long do you think it'll take before it'll sort of hit its prime in the sense that it'll be a universally recognized concept across most of the, not just the foundations that have impact as their mission in the beginning, but along the mainstream investors? Will it be three years, five years, 10 years, longer than that? Ani, you want to give that a shot? Give it a shot. I don't know if I know the answer that's exactly. Um, but so maybe I'll change it in that I sometimes say I'll die happy if we don't need to have an impact investing field because we integrate these ideas into how we do investing because it's just good investing. So yes, I've been involved in helping to create this industry, but I think the ultimate goal is not to have this separate thing. And yes, it's mainstream. We all do it, but it's it's it becomes integrated, and this is called good, good investing. Yeah, I'll echo that 100%. And I'd actually assign, I'd say realistically within 10 years, and I think there are two primary drivers of that timeline. One, to Bonnie's point, is uh, increasingly the things that we do up here are things that other traditional investors do, not because they necessarily want to do the right thing, but because everybody's recognizing water scarcity is material to traditional investments as well. Labor practices are material to traditional investments as well. These ESG factors are becoming uh, increasingly mainstream among traditional investors, and I think as you see SASB become increasingly popular, and as that regulation comes into play, you're going to see a massive uptick. So that's driver number one. Driver number two is we are facing the biggest intergenerational wealth transfer in human history over the next 10 years. Baby boomers are coming into their wealth, they're taking seats in family offices, and they, we, we get these calls every single day saying, hi, I'm 25, I just didn't, took a seat in the family office, turns out we're invested in Halliburton and Exxon. How do I fire my advisors? What can I invest in instead? Um, that's happening and it's happening more and more often and you're gonna see that continue to happen over the next 10 years. Um, so that's the timeline. I think one of the things that's stopping the real growth of this is the institutional money not coming in yet. So if you think about the PIMCOs, where if we just got a 1% allocation there, I don't know how much money that is, but that's a ridiculous amount of money. And we've got like a first-time investor problem. We still can't, we don't have enough, for example, in what I do, enough players that have serious hundred million dollar returns that they can show. So in some ways that 10 years makes some sense to me because a lot of the funds that are starting now, by that time, they will have some returns to show. And once we make that happen, I think, I think no, money's just, gonna pour just in. Just to point out, Julius, BlackRock has the Impact Investing Group, Bain Capital has the Impact Investing Group. They're not doing early stage. Right. Now that could be because their traditional funds don't do early stage, but so that's a yep. small differentiation, but they do, they are doing forms of impact investing. Other questions? Um, where's the mic? Let's again start in the back and we'll move it up front. Hi, just a quick question on some of the old line industries that might have historically been associated with impact investing, affordable housing, energy, et cetera. I didn't hear much about that tonight. 
Um, is that because there's not much focus on it in this new world of impact investing, or it's gone away? Can you comment a little bit on that? I mean, definitely that's, that's a piece of it. Um, the whole community development financial institution world is still quite there, and it's something that we encourage our members to be aware of in terms of getting, you know, investing in affordable housing opportunities, et cetera. Um, you know, environment, what, what else were the other ones you said? Energy. Energy, yeah. That, I mean, we're looking at the, the deals that presented um, yesterday at the New York meeting. There was one that was a, a battery company that was, you know, it's, it's a new next generation alternative to lithium ion, more environmentally sustainable, et cetera. So still quite, I mean, probably half of our deals over the years have been environment. And we do have a lot of investors still interested in models, you know, that, are, that have workforce development. Um, and, I, you know, I could tell some more stories about that. But definitely those are still in play, even if we haven't necessarily referred to them up here. G Julius, you've done energy deals, I believe. Just yeah. outing you on the energy side there. Yeah, yeah. So we're actively doing energy deals. The one point I'll make is that what is impact, at least for us, evolves over time. What's impact today in a decade won't be impact. One of the reasons is they get solved. So mm -hmm. you're going you're gonna to move forward. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. This is an evolving market, and I would expect it to continue. Mike's coming forward, but we'll, while it's back there, we'll, we'll, we'll move it up. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on benchmarking the impact side as opposed to the you know, ROE, which are more direct metrics. You know, how do you keep the organizations accountable? How do you evaluate the impact that you've had? Kurt, do you want to address that on the health side? Yeah, in the healthcare space, I think it's a little more straightforward. It can get complicated, but we we have a mandate, and we actually have to report in all of our quarter, quarterly reports, our annual reports, and in our annual meeting what our impact is. And for us, it's defined by the lives saved and the number of lives improved. And fortunately for us, we can look at a, a product and make some educated guesses about if we deliver it to a million people, uh, these are the number of lives that will be improved, you know, based on metrics that we have from, you know, uh, the natural course of the disease without treatment. So I, I think in a lot of ways it's probably easier in the healthcare space, uh, but it is something that we are accountable for. And it, it's interesting to me at our, at our annual meetings, our investors are just as, and, and I would say probably more interested in those impact numbers uh, compared to the financial return numbers, uh, which, which is, you know, something that I, I think is great. I think we need to have both, uh, but they're, they're definitely as interested, if not more interested, in, in those impact numbers, and they pressure test them with us. So, you know, we go through what, what assumptions were, were used and what our, our references were, um, the sources for the data, all of that. So um, I, I think it's pretty solid. Hey, um, I have a question more for the seed investors. You guys have seen a lot of entrepreneurs come into the industry. Um, we talked about, about the investing side, the ROI side. What kind of advice would you give for early stage entrepreneurs in this industry? Um, things they can do better or worse because it is a different industry to be an entrepreneur in versus traditional tech or other industries. Um, a couple things. I think if you're coming at it from the impact side, make sure you realize that core and critical is the business model because you're not going to have the impact unless there really is a model there that can scale. Um, so sometimes we see a lot of entrepreneurs maybe coming in and just talking all about, isn't this wonderful? Here's the wonderful things we're going to do. But very quickly, we're not too excited if it's not clear that there isn't a real business model there that looks like it has some, has some legs. Um, people coming from the other side sometimes don't know how to talk about the impact side um, and just and that comes down to kind of really having a sense of what is the impact and being able to articulate that and how it fits into the model. Um, so I think really thinking about how those two things integrate is what's so important. And what we're looking for is a company whose impact is core to what they're doing in their product or service so that as the company grows and is financially successful, it's generating the positive impacts too. And so understanding that connection is, is what to think about. And, what, and, and the other thing I'm going to say is that if, if you're driven by wanting to address a problem, learn about that problem and look at who else is already doing things and what people have tried. 
and make sure you know because I, you know, if, you know, we have another cook stove company come to me like they invented this idea. I think I might scream at them because it ain't new. So <laughs> make sure you go out, do your homework, understand what has already gone on and, and what you're doing that's different and innovative that's going to address what hasn't worked before. Um, and the nonprofits and others working in the space too. So really do your homework. It sounds like Bonnie and I should have a support group in this. <laughs> um, the thing about mission alignment is really, really important. And I think the, one of the ways to think about it is that impact should just be an externality. In the ideal world, the holy grail, at the board meeting, when we're talking about it, we never have to talk about impact. You just talk about growing the company and making money, and then voila, you've got impact. So many of the companies that I see have this tension. So think of the buy one, give one model. Ethos, I buy this for a buck eighty, I, a nickel gets given to get somebody water. What happens when they can't sell it for a dollar eighty, when it comes down to a buck twenty-five? What are they going to do? They're essentially buying impact. It's not, as you said, it's not core to the business. So um, I'd look for models uh, that have that alignment where if somebody looked at it clinically, they'd go, oh, it's just an externality. There's a lot of problems with uh, businesses that don't have that. And I'll just throw in one other thing here. This is a sort of almost a pet peeve. <laughs> is that when you have, when impact is separate from the commercial model, it's geometrically more complex what the entrepreneurs have to do. You've got to run one set of operations to go impact. Then you have to run another set of operations to do the commercial model. And so I'll leave it at that so we can have more questions. I should say that Julius's comment in the last 30 seconds is the entire impact investing course I teach over a term. <laughs> so thank, thanks for giving away my lectures. But yeah, this, this, is, this is really the core of a lot of these issues. Do you think there's, uh, there's been a lot of talk over the years of an a uh, finance first investor or an impact first investor? Do you think that's a meaningful distinction to where we've come in this industry? Pretty, how do you address that here? So in some cases I think it is, but I think it's a little, it's too much of a simplification. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to my earlier point. I think good financial first investors incorporate ESG either as uh, opportunities to pursue new alpha or frankly as ways to stabilize for beta. Um, if you're not looking at volatility issues related to ESG, you're not looking at the right volatility issues, period. Um, so I think to some extent it's a <coughs> false binary. That being said, we as, as impact investors, as a foundation, um, invest up and down the return spectrum. And there's certainly some deals where we deliberately take concessionary returns because we think it's worth the impact. Uh, and there are other deals where we fully expect above market returns and sometimes get above market returns and we can talk about the return profiles. Um, so I think there's a false presumption that making more money will do less impact and vice versa. Uh, but there's some use to a two by two versus a binary. Uh, sure. So uh, impact investing is a relatively new field uh, and it's hard to have a track record as a first time fund manager. Uh, what would you guys do if you didn't have, obviously, Bill and Melinda Gates or Heron Foundation backing you guys as a first-time fund manager with sort of a limited track record to engage LPs in conversations and actually grow as a first-time fund manager? So I'm going to give you not remotely the answer you want if you're a first-time fund manager. Um, there are enough SJF is raising their fourth fund. Uh, a lot of folks in this space are no longer first-time fund managers. So... Honestly, my first and foremost advice is go see who's out in the space who already has a track record and, and work with them to build a track record because it's no longer where we were 10 years ago. There are people out there with real impressive track records with a series of IPOs under their, their belt. Nancy Fund is another one. I mean, we can run through the laundry list. Um, that being said, if you are a first-time fund manager and, and you don't have a track record and you haven't worked with somebody who has a track record before, over the last, I would say, three years, we're seeing interesting new hubs you can go to to help source LPs. Big Path Capital is one of them. Um, there are a slew of other kind of impact investing investment banks that are popping up. Um, work with them to raise your LPs, because that's increasingly, they're the ones placing calls to us. We're not getting calls from first-time managers. We're getting calls from these hubs who are raising LPs for them. Um, but I think it's harder and harder to be a first-time manager now. Uh, this question is uh, directed to the Heron Fund in the sense that you said that you have 95% of your assets 
were not conforming to what your objectives were in, in um, the social impact. The question I have is, this is probably an issue with most philanthropists that the money you make is on non-impact investing. And now you want to use that money to do social good. Where is the balance? What will you do with your 95% portfolio if the returns on that portfolio are so minimal that you cannot do what you want to do? Great, great question, and we answer it all day, every day. Um, so you'd think I'd have a better answer by now. Um, the fact of the matter is, I'll, I'll take it in multiple parts. Number one, I'll remind you, what is our core function? Our function as a foundation is not to be a hedge fund with a giving program attached. Our core function is to do good things with the money. So I will posit, first and foremost, that even if the returns were uh, below market, we institutionally think that's fine because that's the core function of the money. That being said, let's talk about the return profile. Uh, we benchmark ourselves based on our ability to hit payout, our 5% obligation, plus keep up with inflation and pay for operations. So roughly that back of the envelope means we have to net 6 to 7%, which we have done and continue to do. Granted, it hasn't been many years, and that track record will become increasingly important over the next decade. Um, but again, I think it's a false binary to think you can't do impact investing and still hit your payout obligations. We have been. There's, track, there's increasingly track record from us and others in the field that you absolutely can. Um, but I will remind you of my first and primary point, which is that's not the point of the money. The point of the money is to do good. And uh, sort of... Uh Interesting moment that happened last year, the Rockefeller Foundation made the decision to no longer invest as corpus in oil companies. I think you all know where the Rockefeller Foundation's corpus comes from. Uh, of course, that was more than 100 years ago in terms of the, the, the funds, but they made that decision last year, and that was a really interesting moment. Uh, I think we have time for maybe just a couple more questions, a few more. We're good. One more? I'm told one more. I'm getting signed at the back. Um, Ma'am. Yeah. Hi. Um, a lot of people are gathered uh, today, this week, for, uh, to talk about the SDGs, and we're talking about a year on, and I'm curious, how does that kind of shape perspective? How does that, you know, in terms of deployment on, on projects and resources? This is, this is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Curtis, I would think your work would be within that yeah, agreement. Yeah, we, we, uh, th that comes into play uh, oftentimes um, with us. So that there are there are specific goals, at least in the healthcare space, for the reduction of uh, childhood death rates, as an example. Um, there are certain goals related to HIV, TB, uh, other infectious diseases. And that comes into play uh, quite frequently with us uh, when we're speaking mostly with, with our investors and reporting on uh, what we're doing to actually help to reach those goals. And uh, some of the analysis that we will do um, will say that this can uh, help uh, speed up the process to reach those goals. A lot of times they have 20, 30 goals, and we say with you know, a certain investment in a new therapeutic, we think we can speed that up and help eradicate or drop the prevalence of a condition to a certain level by 2025, as an example. So it, it certainly comes into play. Um, although I, I wouldn't say that it's for our fund, you know, the driving factor. It's something more that we, we reference um, when we're, we're talking about our investments. I believe our time is up. So please join me in thanking the panelists. All right.